celebrating 13 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Dr. Keith Gray, Part 1. Welcome to another edition of Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill. And thank you for the privilege of coming into your home or into your iPhone or wherever we show up in your world. These are great stories about great people whose lives are proof that anything is possible and confirmation for you that your life is a life filled with possibility. Will you embrace it? So uh, thank you for joining us today. And here is another of my proofs, right? This is Dr. Keith Gray. Welcome to uh, the broadcast. Good morning, Howard. Snow Hill. <laughs> See, I can't even get it out. <laughs> Snow Hill, North Carolina, population 2200. Yes. This is where you're from. This is where I'm from, yes. And why did you immediately start to chuckle? Because most people have never heard of Snow Hill. Actually, when people ask me where I'm from, I say Greenville, North Carolina, which is the nearest adjacent, and I wouldn't even call it a metropolitan area, but the largest town in eastern North Carolina. Um, and it, it's kind of, you know, most people say, what good can come from a place like that? Right. That's, that's the kind of impression they get, so that's why I chuckle. Now, talk about growing up in Snow Hill. You are a surgeon. Sure, yes. We'll get to that in just a moment, but you weren't a surgeon when you were growing up there. Right. Tell me about your family, your life in Snow Hill. So, small agricultural community, less agricultural now than it was, but when I was growing up, it was one of the largest tobacco producing counties in the country. And that's what we did as, as school kids. During the summer, you worked in tobacco farming. And so that's what I grew up doing during my summers until my freshman year in college. But clearly, I, that was not my first job choice. Uh, my parents chose that for me for a lot of reasons. So tell me about the educational attainment of your parents. How far had they gone? My, my parents uh, did not have any college uh, education at the time when I was growing up. My mom started college, uh, kind of from a correspondence standpoint, in 1987. She wow. finished in 2005. She did night classes, weekend classes, and she kind of took some time off to get us through our, our post-secondary education. My dad did not have any higher level education after high school. Um, so this, we were blazing new trails together uh, with, this, with this college um, you know, attendance and graduation and, and, and further training. Is your extended family in Snow Hill as well? Did you have grandparents there as well? I did have grandparents there, uh, both sides. My parents grew up in that area, not specifically in Snow Hill, but my parents and grandparents grew up in that general area in eastern North Carolina, so a lot of extended family there. Walk me through a day working tobacco. Sure. So you arrive, we had to be in the fields at about 6 o'clock, so that means I got up at 5, and the employer picked pick me up, 5.30, we're there, and so tobacco is stored in these barns and is cured by heat. And so we'd be responsible for removing the tobacco from the barns that had already cured to the point that it was ready for market. And then we'd go in the fields and harvest to fill up that same barn that we had just emptied. Um, so it was an all-day process. I'd get home, I'd have you know, an hour for lunch, and I'd, I'd finish up and get home at about 6 p.m. And then I had a, actually I had a job at the grocery store, so I'd leave and go to the grocery store and work till 9 o'clock. So. Physically describe... Um, picking or pulling tobacco. Is it called pulling or picking? Well, we call it cropping. Cropping tobacco. Uh, uh, people so call it different things. Physically describe that to me. Show so, me with so, your hands. So a tobacco plant is, is probably, a mature plant is probably four or five feet tall, and the, the, the leaves ripen from the bottom up. And so we, we get the leaves that were ripe at the bottom of the stalk in one, in one harvest. And then in subsequent weeks, it'd be another harvest. And so over a period of about three different harvests, you'd, you'd remove the leaves from the entire plant. And basically, uh, it, it's a, it's a two-handed maneuver where I would wrap around the back of the stalk and do a maneuver like this, and I would gather four, five, six leaves at a time, put them on what we call a harvester, where we'd be riding a four-man, it's almost like a four-man trailer. My brother actually sat right there in front of me. I sat here, we'd talk, and it, it was automatic. But that's where I first realized that I, I could use my hands really well. So you had this, this manual dexterity. Absolutely. And it was accelerating. So you yes. were able to, to crop at a rate like an adult. Correct. And then my brother and I were the youngest members of the crew. Uh, this was the 
an era of migrant workers and other adults, you know, working in the in the farming industry, and we realized that you know we could we could hold our own, um, and that, that sounds you know weird. You, but we, we started to extrapolate that, man, if I can use my hands doing this, maybe I could use my hands doing something else and do it for a living. Wow. This is Dr. Keith Gray. You're watching Anything is Possible. Oh, this is just the beginning of this story. <laughs> this gets really good. We'll take a break. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. I tell my mom specifically, my dad hadn't, hadn't come home from work yet. And she looked me in the eye. She didn't know any surgeons either, and I know that retrospectively. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. This is Dr. Keith Gray. So you were describing for me cropping tobacco. Yes. And you and your brother working together. Uh, at what age did you start doing this? I was about 12, and I think my brother was at the time 9 or 10. He started a year after I did, so he started at age 10. What would happen to your hands? Are, do you have gloves on as you're doing this, or is this barehanded? So initially, no, barehanded. And there's this gummy residue that's on your hands the entire summer. So this is obviously a summer process for us in North Carolina. And when you got back to school, interestingly, during the fall, everyone knew what you did during the summer by looking at your hands. It was wow. no hiding it and said I had a, a high-level job. It was evident. Uh, by by the way your hands look. So it left this gummy residue under your fingernails that was that was there for a few weeks even after the season was over. Were you ashamed of that? Uh, a little bit. A little bit, I think so. Um, you know, I think a lot of people want to be more than they are, pretend to be someone they're not. Um, but I'm, I'm thankful. We were talking a little bit of before, you know, before the show started about mentorship. I'm, I'm thankful that my parents saw beyond that and had a vision of what that would do for me 30 years from now. They believed that something was possible. They wanted you to do this. Absolutely. Why? First of all, they wanted to build character. They wanted to build work ethic. They wanted me to always know what it would be like not to be a doctor. Um, my Angelou told me one time, she said, I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. And my, my parents essentially told me that without the poetry 30 years ago. They wanted me to never look at someone else and look down on what they did mm. or to judge them by what they do. And uh, like I said, I, I, as I told you before, this, it was the most influential part of my life. When, as you're cropping tobacco, do you get the first uh, glimmer of possibility with regards to being a doctor? Ninth grade, summer after my ninth grade. You know year. specifically. A absolutely, remember the day like it was yesterday. What day was that? So I'm sitting, I'm, I'm just finishing up ninth grade year, just taking anatomy physiology, Vera Russell was my biology professor, and I'm sitting with my brother and I say, man, we're, we're, you know, we're pretty good with our hands and I loved anatomy physiology last year. Maybe I can combine the two and do something you know, as a career. And I said, well, you know, we started to brainstorm. I said, well, what is that? And, and I said, maybe a surgeon. Hmm. And I didn't, I didn't know any surgeons. Uh, I knew my doctor, my, my primary care physician. So I, I go home and I tell my parents that. And I tell my mom specifically, my dad hadn't, hadn't come home from work yet. And she looked me in the eye. She didn't know any surgeons either, and I know that retrospectively. She said, how about Surgeon General? Dang. And we started on this path. Of being a surgeon, neither of, none of us knew what it would take. Uh, none of us knew anyone that had gone down that path, but we, we blazed that trail together. I talked to a guy recently, and everybody in his family, everybody in his uh, family tree is a surgeon going back 10 generations. Mm -hmm. So he would have some sense sure. of what it is. Sure. You have zero. None, zero. <laughs> right. So I would say to, to those of you viewing today that that's what this whole possibility thing is about. It's about that moment in your life where you, where you say, maybe a surgeon, where that even becomes an idea or a possibility. Yep. So, and your mother says, not just surgeon, surgeon general. Right. So how do we get from there to being a surgeon? Because if that's ninth grade, <laughs> that's a long way that's to a long, becoming a surgeon. That's a long way. She, she, we had the vision, we had the destination, but we knew the journey is a stepwise process, stepwise process. And so it started with, and, and 
there was a, I had a visit from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics to Snow Hill when I was an eighth grader. And it involved in uh, going to a magnet school for two years during your 11th and 12th grade year in, in high school. And I said I would never do that, be, you know, for a lot of reasons, friends, et cetera. Then when I had, sh we had this vision, we revisited that idea. Maybe, that, maybe that's something I should pursue. Now was the friends thing, you didn't want to be a nerd? A little bit. A little bit, but did you know? I, I I wanted to be top dog at where I where I was. I mean, I, I was second. I fluctuated second and third in my class. National Honor Society. I could have had a chance to be the salutatorian. All those things, you know. But if you athletic, go to a place where everybody is a one, oh man, you may be sitting on the bench. <laughs> right. You may be sitting on the bench, and and I wasn't sure I was ready for that. But then, when we had this idea, she said maybe that's not a bad idea. So we started that process to shorten the story. We got accepted there. I finished there, went to Wake Forest on a full scholarship, uh, went to medical school there, Vanderbilt residency, uh, which was seven years, did a little two years of research in the middle of that, and then to MD Anderson in Houston for my surgical oncology training, and then to here. Here's what's neat about this story, by the way. It was the cropping of tobacco <laughs> that sealed getting the residency at Vanderbilt. Right, that's right. It, I mean, isn't it amazing how God makes it all work together? It's all part of the thing. That's right. So your father and your mother want you to crop tobacco because of the valuable things you will learn. Right. You've got this vision of becoming a doctor and you have no idea how to get there. And you have no idea that cropping tobacco will be the thing that's right. that puts you in the place that you want to be. Tell that story. So part of your residency application is, is, a, is a personal statement like all applications. And so I write about a day in the life of Keith Gray working in the tobacco fields of Eastern North Carolina to show them that I could do the residency work. I could get up at 4 a.m. and work, you know, 30 hour shift or whatever because I'd done it before. I hadn't done the specific work, but I've been through the process. So my program director, John Tarpley, he would love for me to mention his name, one of my best friends today read that and said, we got to interview this kid. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll say, I'll be transparent and say, you know, from a, from a grade standpoint, again, you, now you've moved up another echelon. So I, I, I didn't stand out academically among, uh, uh, you know, from the rest of the, the applicants, but I had something that he grabbed onto. He brought me in, and as my wife says, man, if I can get to the interview, I, I got a chance. And so we talked, we never talked about medicine, we talked about crop and tobacco, him in Middle Tennessee, me in Eastern North Carolina, and we sealed the deal. And he looked at my dad, my, he was, we were walking down the plaza at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and he looked at my dad and said, we want this guy here. The first time I ever felt like I was being recruited for anything, but I loved it. He I told your dad that. He told my dad, my dad was with me, my dad did all my interviews with me. Wait and, a minute, your dad did all of your interviews with yeah, you? Yeah, we traveled around the southeastern part of the United States you know, from interview to interview. Um, why, why did he do all of them with you? As I mentioned before, I always say we, it's collective. It's first person plural. We did this, it wasn't me. I didn't have the, I had an idea. Uh, they had, they empowered me, they mentored me, they encouraged me. And without that, there, there would be no, there would be no this, there'd be no anything is possible. Wow, that, that, is, that is amazing. So your father was very, He's a smart man. Absolutely. He understood that you would need a value system to undergird your professional accomplishments. Yes. Because that's what would create professional durability, if sure. you will. Sure, sure. Yeah, and has that paid off? Absolutely. When you, you know, now that I, li I, I read about leadership and, and, and I've had a chance to do a few things, it all goes back to work ethic, it all goes back to integrity it all, it all goes back to the people that you have around you that provide mentorship uh, because things are going to get tough, you know. It, they, they will get tough. That is a guarantee. So what do you have, you know, when, when the wind and the rain comes, you know, is the sand going to shift? The sand will shift, but is your foundation solid? And my foundation was solid from 12 years old. Wow. So um, we're going to pick up the story in just a moment. I just, I'm blown away because I didn't know the part about your father going to all your interviews. And I'm just trying to imagine what it felt like for your father, not for you, mm. for mm. your father to receive the word, we want your son. Yeah. 
and for him to have seen that in you as a kid, he said, this is what I can do. I can give this kid this. Yeah. Did he ever talk to you about what that meant or means to him? Is he still alive? He's still alive, yeah. And we haven't. And I don't know that it, that it resonated with me like that and just until, you know, just, just until right now. Let's take a break. When we come back, let's talk about that a okay. little bit. Okay, that'd be great. Um, Anything is possible, and this is proof. This is Dr. Keith Gray. Oh, the story is just, we're just getting into it. We'll be right back. Coming up. Uh, it, it's always a privilege. I never take it for granted. It's always a privilege to serve the patient in whatever way that I can. This week, our Home Federal Community Spotlight is on the Cerebral Palsy Center, helping those with disabilities prove Anything is possible. To learn more and see how you can get involved, visit cpcenter.org. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. I'm Hal in Hilton Hill. If you're just joining us, uh, this is Dr. Keith Gray. He's a surgical oncologist at the University of Tennessee. Thank you for joining us you're today. You're welcome. Pleasure. So you, you had never thought about what this means to your father. Uh, we left off in the story with you uh, securing a residency at Vanderbilt on the strength of having cropped tobacco in Snow Hill, North Carolina. That's right. And uh, your mentor and friend, what, what is his name again? John Tarpley. John Tarpley turns to your dad, who was attending all of your interviews with you, to say, we want this guy. That's right. And so you've never thought about what that meant to him. No, no. Because this is a quantum leap for your entire family. Absolutely. And your father wanted to be there. Yes, I mean, we made, it, we made a decision. We're gonna do this together. We chose not to fly. Um, like I said, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky. And you drove. We drove all around. So what were those conversations like? Oh man, it was, my dad's pretty introverted, so am I. And uh, you know, my dad was an encourager by his presence. Um, athletics, he was always there. Uh, he didn't say a whole lot. Um, he wasn't a touchy-feely person. But to get an opportunity to be in the car together to talk about the future, what it might be, this, op this moment right now that it could be, uh, was a time that I, it was one of the most precious times in my life uh, that I can remember. Have you, ever, have you ever imagined that you are, you and your brother, his brother is a dentist, by the way, we haven't even gotten to that, but ha have you ever considered the fact that you are really the fulfillment of his possibility. Absolutely, I, I think I think I have. My, you know, when my father and mother graduated, there weren't a lot of opportunities for African American. Uh, they were poor, um, needed to work, had to work, um, and so I think about that often. Um, and it's been, and I will tell you, it's it's been positive, and there've been some negatives with that as well. Because what have been the negatives? You wind up living. Sometimes you you pursue dreams that are not always your own. Um, you're, you feel like it, 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 there's always the pressure not to let them down. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's added pressure onto pressure that's all, already heavy from pursuing, you know, a surgical oncology career, whatever career you decide to pursue. When did you decide on surgery, uh, surgical oncology? Because you could have done any numbers sure. and, and, you know, a lot of different forms of surgery. My, I, I didn't decide on it, to be honest with you. My wife chose that for me. She, fourth year, Vanderbilt, we, we, my wife and me, decided. <laughs> so your wife is a physician as well? My wife's a psychiatrist by training. Um, but we, in residency together, deciding what we wanted to do, uh, what fellowship, if any. Uh, she said, I think you make a great oncologist. Her dad's an oncologist. She said, I think you make a great oncologist. She said, you love the people. Um, you like the elective surgery the opportunity to, to learn lifetime and to, and to invest in people, I think it'd be awesome. And to make a long story very short, I, I went to MD Anderson and spent a month there looking at the opportunity there, fell in love with it, and it's been, I have no regrets. Tell me about your very first surgery. Wow. I'm trying to imagine going from this to making that first incision. So it was the first week I was on a surgical rotation uh, my third year in medical school, uh, 1997, I think it was, and I didn't like surgery. I actually called my wife from the hospital, no cell phones, then called my wife and said, man, I'm not sure I like this, but we got a guy, a young African-American male that was shot uh, in the back of his thigh, uh, 
and I got a chance to go to the operating room and assist with the procedure. And there was no turning back after that. Really? No turning back. I, I was, it was so exhilarating. Um, you know, I knew this, this is, was what God designed me to do. And there was no turning back. And there were some, there were some really, really tough days, you know, after that resident, because this was medical school, but after that, long days, long weeks, and long months and years, but never did I think about doing anything else. Never do I wake up in the shower thinking about anything else other than my family than surgery. When, when you scrub in mm -hmm. uh, and you look at your hands and you inspect your hands. Mm -hmm. That's good. Can That's you good. finish that for me? You thinking know about what the, the gum and the residue. Do you ever think about that? I do, I do. And I think about, but I don't think about where I've, what I've accomplished. I think about what a privilege it is to get to wash my hands four or five times a day and for someone to put my gown and gloves on. Uh, it, it's always a privilege. I never take it for granted. It's always a privilege to serve the patient in whatever way that I can. And I, and I, think, I think if you'd ask my staff, I think I, I, I hope to try to treat them, treat them in that way, that it is a privilege. You know what, this is... One episode is not enough <laughs> to, to finish the story the way I want to finish it. I'm going to ask you to hang on for a, a second episode. Sure. Folks, this is the story of Keith Gray. It is a story of possibility. And uh, this is part one. And coming up next week, uh, you'll see part two. Or if you're watching online, um, you can see part two by just going to our YouTube channel and searching AIP online. And if you know a young person, doesn't matter where they're from, what their background is, Make sure that you send them this link so that they can see this incredible story of possibility. This is Dr. Keith Gray. You'll see part two uh, next time. We'll see you next time. I'm Hallor at Hilton Hill.